by the time it was flagged up to me, I was offside by about twelve thousand dollars. We're talking mm. in the space of two or three minutes. Yeah. And again, that's scary. <laughs> similar conversation. I've got head of trading leaning over his sort of little partition and saying, <laughs> "Tim, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> are you running this trade? Because if you run this from here onwards, you're taking the loss." So. Um, I decided to hold the trade for just a few more minutes. Right. I had a limit to get out at scratch. Yeah. Went on for a couple more minutes. I'm now sort of 16, maybe $20,000 in the hole. Wow. Hello and welcome to this trader interview series. My name's Michael Taylor from Shifting Shares and I'm delighted to be joined in person <laughs> by Tim Sunderland Founder of Mito Markets. Yep, thank you for having me. A bit of plot for getting over here, but we only actually live a few miles apart, so it seemed like a nice yeah. opportunity to actually meet in person. So yeah, very happy to be here in a very nice suburb of North London, I must say. Very kind, <laughs> and nice to have a beer yeah, as absolutely. well. Cheers. A non-alcoholic Yeah, beer, yeah. of course, because uh, we don't drink during market hours. Yeah. That would not be uh, great. Speak for yourself. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so you've obviously had a, a career as a stockbroker and you do investments yeah. on the side as well. But I, I do remember you telling me a story of how you founded Mito Markets. Yeah, um, slightly unfortunate circumstances, but I guess comes a, a wonderful outcome. Um, over the years, I've been a stockbroker now for sort of 12 odd years. Um, it was actually in my last firm, a place called Valbury Capital, they decided to close down their UK offices. Now, when you're a stockbroker or, or any sort of um, consultancy type role, you normally have these non-compete clauses, which means you can't work at another rival firm for maybe six months. Now, not for a moment did I think that they would actually uh, want to <laughs> push forward on this clause, considering the firm was closing down. But the firm closed down, I made redundant. I then get a new job at another place, which was a bit of a dream job, if I'm honest, it was at a place called Britannia Global Markets, a really good brokerage. And then within an hour, uh, I was sacked. <laughs> oh <dear. laughs> because they, they received a letter saying that, unfortunately, Tim is not meant to be working here. Uh, he is still under a non-compete clause. Um, so, and that was that. And, and it was at that point I thought, you know what? I'm sick of being stuck in this non-compete <laughs> trap. Yeah. And it was at a time, we had just, just gone into lockdown I think it was March, April, May, something like that, March 2020. I thought, you know what, there's there's just a nice opportunity here. I've done this for 10, 12 years now. Let's go at it myself. Mm -hmm. Took out a business loan uh, for £50,000 and set up Mito Markets, which has now been going for, will be two years, September, which is in just yeah. a day. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, two, two year anniversary. <laughs> so that's, that's how Mito Markets um, came about. Sometimes people ask me what, what does Mito mean? It's a very loose translation of just exchange in ah, Latin. It just means I didn't to, know that. Yeah, <laughs> to exchange, to receive, to give. So it just means exchange markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's how it all came about. Yeah, it's, it's um, I think it takes well a lot of minerals to, to start your own business, especially in well March, April 2020. So yeah, uh, well done for, for going ahead. And um, you just got investment now. You? Yes, I've uh, just done another capital raise, um, which, strangely enough, did come through this. We've gone full circle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll mention, I don't think he'll mind being mentioned on, on the podcast. It was actually a chap called Wheelie Dealer, who you mm -hmm. know. Went for a beer with him in Windsor. Really nice chap. I do recommend you um, catch him on Twitter. He then introduced me to the good man here, Michael Taylor, who then introduced me to another chap <laughs> called David, who then introduced me to another chap called Guy, who then um, did the last capital raise. So, yeah. Um, just completed that and actually I tell you what it's like it's like I've done a degree in business <laughs> doing a capital raise because uh, to give you an example I mean the, the first investor call I did you know this is all new to me I, you know I might be mm. a good stockbroker but being a good businessman they're two completely yeah, separate two different things hats, yeah. exactly I I was absolutely roasted this guy sat on the zoom call who's very senior has done hundreds of capital raises has exited businesses He's going through this list and just absolutely tearing me a new one. Good tip. Yeah. So he goes, right, so, so what university do you go to? One of the red bricks? I go, no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing you worked your way up into Google or Apple. You, you, you've been at a senior position there? No, none of that. <laughs> okay, well, you've exited a business before, right? I said, no. 
He goes, right, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Tim, this is pretty underwhelming. This is this is poor going <laughs> oh, so that's, far. That's not very nice. That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a bit mean. <laughs> I know. Um, and my girlfriend at the time was like, God, what absolute... But actually, I, I really enjoyed it because it was like, mm. you have to go through those horrible experiences to get better at anything. Yeah. Now I did the next pitch, the next pitch went a bit better, and then a bit better off that, and a bit better off that. So it did become a really sort of well-polished, um, nice narrative of, of a brokerage with some really good prospects going forward. Um, and I raised the capital, but mm. yeah, it did take a little while <laughs> and it took a lot of failure, um, upwards failure, I suppose to say. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, you got there in the got end. Got there in the end, exactly. Which is good. Yeah. Mm. What exactly does Mito specialise in? So, you know, if anyone's watching and mm. will be interested, because you offer quite a personalised service, which I guess yeah. is different to exactly. a lot of the main shops. So, I'll tell you what, the, the idea behind Mito, and this is very selfish, I designed a brokerage that I want myself. Um, so, That's usually the best yeah, type of business. Yeah, exactly. So it tends to be two segments of the market. So at the very top end, very high-end service, you've got your likes, your Hargreaves, Lansdowne, maybe Redmond, Bentley, Killick, and Charles yeah. Stanley, and they're really good for service. You can pick up the phone, and you're straight through to a highly qualified broker of mm. many years. Well, well, not always. Not always, not uh, always. I mean, remember in uh, 2020, it took me six minutes yeah, to get yeah, a fill. Exactly. And usually, you know, the Killick will pick up in a few rings. Yeah, yeah. They shout across the dealer and it'd be done. But, but yeah. Um, yeah, I guess in times of volatility, you, if you don't have general, an actual platform, yeah, it can be a bit, a bit scary. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, I guess I was maybe doing the GameStop fiasco and stuff like that. Yeah, pretty much when every man and the dog were, was dealing stocks and yeah, exactly. people were volatility just went through the roof. I yeah. know, it was mental. So the idea was to be able to, if I could replicate that kind of service, um, have a qualified broker on hand available from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., mm -hmm. but not have to charge the silly sort of eye watering fees that come with it. Because yeah. typically, what you spend, you'll spend about what 30 to 50 quid to actually sort of place a trade over it's, the phone. It's, and it's like for, I can't think of anywhere that's less 40 quid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got what trading two, one, two, free trade. Less, and they, I think the less I've said about that. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know what? Everyone has their, their place in the market. And if yeah, you are yeah, a complete first timer and you want something that's so simple and easy to understand, they are fantastic platforms. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Um, and I thought if someone can sort of come in and bridge that gap and offer ultra low cost dealing, like a fiver, something mm. like that, but also have the sort of very high touch service, surely there's got to be a market for that. Um, and also a place which doesn't offer commission only broken because mm. I, you know, when I set up Mito Markets, there was the option was like, right, do I charge commission or do I do commission yeah. free? Now I can't go to a family barbecue or a family gathering and someone says, Tim, is it true you're offering commission free training? So I know it's a bare face lie. Yeah. It's not commission free. I mean, yes, it's technically commission free, but they're gonna be market the spreads and the prices. The FX conversion if you're trading in and out of international stocks is gonna be I mean, worse than what you get at an airport. Yeah. God forbid you use their leverage and you actually <laughs> use their credit facility. Because like, so I looked at a couple of places and they are charging, it's between 33 and 36% a year um, oh, wow. interest on the margin loan, which is just, wow, that is I mean, it's disgusting. Yeah. You may, you're in payday loan territory. And <laughs> I, I, let, let's say, for instance, Apple, which goes up about, on average, over the last five years, 20, 25% a year. Mm. Even if you just went long Apple and you're making twenty five percent a year, but you're paying thirty three percent in interest the whole position, it just it's just null and void the whole idea of that. So yeah. I thought let's keep it low cost, high touch, um, mid market pricing, interbank rates on the FX, mm -hmm. and surely that's a good service. So yeah. that was that's the whole idea behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not unique, it's not special, but it's just very good at what it does. Yeah, yeah. There's I know of the broker uh, sort of new. I think it's called shares shares app or something yes and they're charging like 70 bits a trade which you know is incredible yeah yeah um, but it, it's i mean it's insane that people can charge that and get away with it because know. you know if regularly you can pay 10 yeah um and even less if you do a lot yeah, of business yeah. so exactly you yeah. really have to check that these things like what you're actually paying because if it says commission free They've got to make yeah. their money somehow. And exactly. It's, it's, not, yeah. it's not a crime to make money from sort of offering a business proposition and all the rest of the service. It seems to be recently. Yeah. I just, yeah. I hate the yeah. idea of that someone trying to pull the wool over my eyes. Mm. Don't mind paying for something as long as I know what I'm paying. Then exactly. It's, then it's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, and it seems like the, the, the real theme at the moment is the FX. So like, mm. for instance, if you're trading away from a UK stock and you're trading in the US market, you might buy some Apple. You know they'll make sure that you'll pay the FX. You, you go and buy some Apple, and you'll be charged twice on the FX because then it will convert any remaining money back into pounds and stuff like that. And you're charging obscene 
spread on that. So I just don't like the lack of transparency. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good thing to, to have. Yeah. Yeah. So have you got any secrets of being a stockbroker or any stories? <laughs> a lot of stories. <laughs> um, I can imagine you have plenty of those. Yeah. yeah. It's a good, good, good subject to broach, actually, because um, breach. I'm on the other side, so mm. I look at a book of several hundred clients, they're all trading in and out. Um, and over the years, and I can see it myself as well, sort of the difference between just some sort of behavioural traits between good yeah. traders and bad traders. Um, first and foremost, I'd say the bad ones, very easy to get emotionally attached to a right. trade. Because if you've done all your research and it's, you know, you go, go on look through all the pros and cons. I think the airline is down. I think EasyJet has got a really rock bottom valuation here. I think there's more upside here. Mm. You've convinced yourself of your own argument. Yeah. And if you convince yourself of your own argument, you need to be prepared to actually admit that you're maybe a bit of an idiot and you're <laughs> short-sighted in certain areas. Mm. Um, and it's the guys who maybe don't go through a forensic treatment of trying to prove themselves wrong and come up with a trade idea and get emotionally attached to it. That is the first one, which I noticed straight away. And it sounds bad, but if, if you're... You're chasing a losing trade and you're mm. averaging down constantly. People ask me, like, isn't trading like gambling? Well, you can turn it into yeah. leverage <laughs> very quickly if you want it to be. I've done it myself. In fact, I remember the first trade I did. You'll know this company because you trade the um, AIM stocks. Do you remember Range Resources? I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Absolute crunk of <laughs> insert swear word. Um, and there was a lot of hype and pomp and all the rest around it. And yeah, I bought it at sort of 15 pence a share. Mm -hmm. Convinced myself this thing was going to go to a quid. Like there's, <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was 15p to a quid, and nothing else was going to convince yeah. me otherwise. <laughs> go it's, down. All, it's always a quid. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. Every penny stuff doesn't exactly. matter. It's one Let's get to that magic pound coin. It's a pound. I yeah. know. Goes down to sort of 11 and a half pence, which fair drop. Oh, yeah, I mean that's 30, 30. I know. Yeah. Right. Let's put another 1500 quid in. It's gone down. <laughs> 8p well it's i mean they've got this thing in trinidad tobago they've done the 3d seismic survey they've done this they've got that <laughs> surely it's going to go back up and then yeah down to 6p bought some more down to 4p bought some more oh, and God. actually <laughs> i i must have pumped in about five thousand pounds right which at 19 years old that was my first year that's a lot of money yeah i mean it's all money. relative isn't it yeah. i know people when you're 19 you've got a few quid people are going out buying the first cars i just Blew it all in some crappy aim stuff. Yeah, well, we've all done that. <laughs> yeah. um, I've certainly um, done that. Before. And it got down to about 100 quid or 150 quid. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes actually no sense, actually, to sort of cut your losses down because yeah. obviously by then you think, well, there's only really upside. But for me, I needed some sort of emotional disconnect. I needed to sort of mm -hmm. cut that tie and actually move on to something else because it was just really playing on my mind. So yeah. actually, five grand into 150 quid, cut my loss there. <laughs> It's <laughs> a very expensive lesson. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd say don't get emotionally attached to the stock. Mm. Um, and you know, I've done it. Everyone's done it. Everyone's done um, it. Yeah. And even to this day, I have to sort of really sort of have strong words myself and remind myself of that. That this is just a number on a screen. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give a fuck about you. This isn't yeah. some sort of <laughs> second home in the Cotswold which you can get emotionally attached to, <laughs> and you're sort of chasing the bid across. It's just a number on the screen. That's all it is. It doesn't mm. care about you. So why should you care about it? You know? Yeah, that, that's, that's it. That's I all mean, it is. I've said before that, you know, trading is like a video game mm. in a sense. Like rather than me looking at the numbers and what they actually mean, I'm just looking for a chart pattern. Yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah. looking to buy it. And I don't really care whether it's like overpriced, underpriced, or even if I yeah. sold it and then I'm buying it higher. It yeah. doesn't really matter. Yeah. Like what I'm trying to do is buy right. Yeah. And not like buy cheap or buy yeah. for a good price or that's you know, another thing. Whatever. I mean I, I see this all the time on Twitter, people sort of coming out and go, oh, I just bought some XYZ down down here. Looks mm. a bit cheap down here. And that <laughs> is the whole sort of thesis behind their investment philosophy, yeah. is it? it just looks a bit cheap down <laughs> looks here. Looks a bit cheap, yeah. yeah exactly. Then it drops twenty percent. Yeah, and yeah exactly. Cheaper, so oh, we're gonna buy more now. And I tell you what, yeah. really nice exercise to sort of run through your mind. And I did this a little while ago with ASOS. Because Asos mm. has had a terrible run. Yeah, it's been smacked, hasn't it? Yeah, and a friend of mine, Jed, he was like, oh, Asos looks a bit cheap <laughs> down here. And I said, you're right, it does, but it looked cheap six months ago, mm. and it looked cheap six months before <laughs> then as well, and it looks cheap three months yeah. before then. So just because it looks cheap now doesn't mean it can't drop another 20 30%. Yeah. Um, 
Strangely enough, I, I think I'm sort of more in the habit. I don't mind paying a higher price for a stock mm. if it's got an uptrend confirmed again. Yeah. You know, if it's back up the 200 day moving average, things are looking, you know, back in check. Because even by the time you wait for it to go back into an upward trend, you still might be buying it at a lower price because it may mm. have dropped so much more between yeah, now and then. Yeah, people, people don't think that. Do yeah. They? I mean, yeah, if something's fallen from like 100 mm. and it looked cheap, but eventually it gets to 20. Yeah. You know, that, that share, even though it's fallen 80%, yeah, yeah. it's still actually half again and yeah. goes to 10. Exactly, yeah. So it doesn't really matter what price you're mm. actually paying because, you know, even if it goes to zero, it doesn't matter where you buy it. Yeah. It's 100% loss. Yeah. And even if it goes down to 20 and then it sort of trends back up to sort of 60 and go, right, this is actually confirmed mm. a good back long-term trend. We're above the 200-day moving average. Yeah. You still bought it cheaper than when you originally scouted it. You mm. know? Yeah, I think I think the only way to like confirm that it's out of a, a downtrend is to wait until it's 100% yeah. off the lows. Because yeah. then once it's like up, you know that there's not that supply yeah. willing to hammer it down because yeah. the price has actually doubled. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, if the supply was there, the price would be smacked back down. Exactly. So personally, I, I don't really buy lows ever unless I feel I've really got an edge. And even yeah. then, I'm like, you know, if, if the price drops, I'm out. I just cut yeah. it quick. Yeah. Because you never know, because you, you get situations where something does drop a tremendous mm. amount. You go, this could be in for a bit of a short squeeze here. Yeah. There could be a takeover bid. And if you're happy to sort of weigh out the risk and sort of say to yourself, I think there's a sort of one in five chance that this is going to have a tremendous squeeze yeah. or, you know, something like that, or 30% chance, then sure. But as long as you've weighed up the risk and you're happy with that and you, you know, you're comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that is another one. Chasing down losses, averaging down continuously, buying mm -hmm. something you think something's cheap. Yeah. Because um, I, I don't know, I've just, having done this for so many years now, or not so many years, but sort of 12 years now, Actually, I've gone full circle and I've, I just enjoy the big names like your Apples, mm -hmm. your Microsofts, your Googles. Oh, God, it's already gone up so much. It's already gone yeah. up so much. <laughs> five, three, like, I mean, the last five years, they've all sort of slightly matched each other. And they, they've gone up between 150 and 250% over the last five years. So what? Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, they, they, they do not stop creating new innovative products. And yeah. Just when you think they've run out of steam, there's another thing, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so you mentioned something of trading errors as well Tim you had a few does, stories yeah. on that <laughs> can happen and does happen mm. I've only made one trade error in my whole career um, can happen to the best of us and if you're watching yeah. something that fair chance I've made... done one where I had an yeah. extra zero on yeah. a trade bet <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then I was like it already the loss on it was so big it yeah. was already bigger than my risk and I was yeah. like okay well got to close this trade down God. and uh, the worst thing was I, was I was trying to make a bit of money at breakfast in the oh, market. Oh, God, you're a bit greedy, yeah. <laughs> and then just ended up costing ended, ended up losing more than the entire holiday. Because <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's an extra zero. Because oh, usually I have my calculator and it, you know, I've got my screen set up. And I was just sort of sipping coffee and you know oh. eat, eating a croissant. And I was like, oh, extra zero. Yeah, so yeah, I just yeah, didn't yeah, really yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah, like, well, you're too invested in your pan of chocolate. Yeah. yeah, so I felt like really stupid. Um, so that, that was annoying. Do, do you know what? I mean, I'd, I'd never say feel stupid. It does happen. It does happen. Yeah, it happens yeah. to the best of us. Uh, I think the, the worst one I saw, I've got one of my own, but it was, it was actually an old colleague of mine from about probably eight or ten years ago now. He was buying some Paddy Power on behalf of a client. Right. Now, this is actually a really good lesson. Paddy Power is listed on the London Stock Exchange, LSE. Yeah. And so you'd assume... One means one penny. Right, However, because yeah. it's an Irish company, it's actually quoted in euros. And when something's traded in dollars or euros, it's whole euros versus yeah. pennies. <laughs> so he's thinking he's bought, um, I think he was trying to buy 25 grand's worth. Mm -hmm. And he thought they were trading it. The number represented a penny, not yeah. a whole euro. He's gone and bought 100x more than he anticipated. <laughs> so we're, we're, you know, we're talking sort of two and a half million euros or something like that. He's called up the market maker, um, the Irish one, I think Davies, gone, yeah, um, can I buy X amount of Paddy Power? And the market mm. maker went, Are you sure you want to buy that much? He goes, Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's only 25 grand. Like, it's the big deal. So he goes, Why? Well, yeah, yeah, I'll stick that down for you. Done. Mm. It's not until about, I don't think he realizes until the next day, oh, in God. fact. <laughs> and this is the worst thing. So the. <laughs> If he'd held it, it would have been fine, but yeah. it had moved down a few ticks by the next day. Mm -hmm. And I think he's sitting on like a loss of about 50 grand, if oh, I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And 
The fur is interesting because the firm then has a decision to make, mm. right? So, you know, d- does the firm now take on this position and run it until hopefully it comes good? Yeah. And how much collateral does the firm have to run this? Because if it, what if the share price keeps dropping? When do we cut yeah, it? Yeah, that's know? it. Yeah, it becomes like a gamble. Exactly. Yeah. This is the thing. And the firm, th- there was a meeting about it, um, not with me because I wasn't the trader who mm. did it, but with the boss and the, the trader in question. And then the decision was, right, let's just cut it now. It's about 50 grand. Yeah. You're going to have to pay for this yourself. Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, wow. the, the trader had to pay for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, firms do have indemnity insurance for situations like this, but you never really want to sort of mm. cash out your indemnity insurance because then your premium goes up. Yeah. Um, there is a rumour that the boss did cash out his indemnity insurance but got the trader to pay for it. <laughs> Who knows? It's just whispers and yeah. rumours. You never, we, never we know. We haven't mentioned the company. Yeah. Have we? Uh, no, no, I haven't mentioned it. Yeah. No, no, I haven't mentioned no, it on lawsuits. purpose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but no, the, the, the trader in question, it, it took him, I think he had to borrow the money from a family member and sort of pay it back yeah. in instalments. But... Really, really tough going. I, yeah. I honestly, my I, my heart goes out to the guy. But it it, it was an easy mistake. Yeah, it is no, trade on the, done. Yeah. It is trade on the London Stock Exchange, and mm. I mean, I knew it traded in whole euros. But you know, what's to say? You know, if if you just gave it a glance, at LSE must trade in pennies. Mm. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, it happens. It's an easy mistake. Yeah, yeah. But well, I mean, if if you're a professional trader, you, you're taking that risk. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So you know, I'm fully on the hook for yeah whatever I lose, which is scary. But that's just why you've got to be extra yeah extra careful. Attention to detail as well. Yeah. My old boss used to say. Um, and there was there's was, there's was one trade error I made. Um, now t- just to give you a bit of context, you know, there are literally thousands upon thousands of product variations of which you can trade. I mean, you can trade portfolio futures if you yeah. want to. You can trade the futures on the option on an interest rate. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as a professional, you do all your exams and you're knowledgeable and you're competent as far as you can, you know, feasibly be. But I was trading euro dollar interest rate options, which right. was something I hadn't traded before. I have, you know, traded all sorts of other options and derivatives in the past. And it was on a multiplier of 250. I thought it was on a multiplier of 10. So right, I, I okay. again, <laughs> I bought way too much than I thought. But the trade through, I did run it through uh, someone in the risk department, and uh, they gave it a quick glance. They weren't actually paying attention. They said, uh, "Yeah, that looks fine." So I did do the right thing in running it through the risk department, but they didn't flag up either as trade yeah. being too big. Turned out, the trade was too big, and within seconds of the trade going on, just the spread alone, I was offside by about six thousand dollars. Right. And in these firms, you take on the risk yourself. Yeah. I would have had to pay for it. By the time it was flagged up to me, I was offside by about $12,000. And we're talking mm. in the space of two or three minutes. Yeah. And again, that's scary. <laughs> similar conversation. I've got head of trading leaning over his sort of like the partition and saying, <laughs> Tim, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> are you running this trade? Because if you run this from here onwards, you're taking the loss. So, um, I decided to hold the trade for just a few more minutes. Right. I had a limit to get out at scratch. Yeah. Went on for a couple more minutes. I'm now sort of sixteen, maybe twenty thousand dollars in the hole. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I was just about to cut it. Um, and then thank God Donald Trump comes out and tweets something, <laughs> completely flip reverses the market, <laughs> swings the position the other way around. I get out at scratch. Yeah. And it was probably the most exhilarating sort of eight minutes of my life. I'd gone from terrifying unwittingly yeah. just doing a trade on behalf of a client to being twenty thousand mm. dollars in the hole, experiencing all that, and then back to scratch. It's like you know celebrating a nil-nil victory, but yeah. hey, I, I, I was absolutely <laughs> fist pumping. Um, so yeah, um, very very scary, mm. but just attention to detail. Take your yeah. time if you're not sure. Ask someone, um, mm. which <laughs> you know, just do it. So yeah, yeah, it does happen, and uh, bloody scary, kind of expensive imagine. as well. Yeah. Would you would you do that again though, Tim, if you're in the same position? Because like when you see when you immediately see you got a big loss, you know, everyone is like that rabbit in the yeah, headlights on. Yeah, them. exactly. And it's like you don't really know what to do and then, I wouldn't do that again. I would yeah. in hindsight I would have just cut that. I think yeah. the first instance I was made aware of it when I said I was about six thousand dollars in the hole. Now I would have just cut that and mm. I would just take that. I was a bit younger then, maybe a bit more bullish. Yeah. <laughs> a bit more full of ego. So well, I decided to run to it. experience as well, doesn't yeah. it? Because I mean, I would have I would have done that in the past, but as soon as I realised I was offside, yeah. I thought, I, this is probably going to come my way. But, yeah. you know, I, I had a risk. 
the spread yeah. has already blown that risk yeah. when I'm truly out of the water. Yeah. So I've got no choice but to sell. Well, they obviously uh, mark the price down. Ex doing, so. Exactly. And I think the other thing is it was quite a volatile um, instrument. So it's like, as long as I had time value, there's a chance of it sort of just swinging back up momentarily yeah. and getting out of that scratch. So I was trying, I was bidding for time value, really, mm. that's what I was doing. So, but the time value was was very quickly wearing away as, as the monetary yeah. value was dropping and the pressure's coming over the desk. Because if it wasn't me who cut it, probably the head of trade would have had to make a call and goes, yeah. right, Tim cannot afford to tolerate this loss on his own. I know what his salary is and he can't afford this. Yeah. Cut it. <laughs> so, yeah, it, 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 the decision would have been taken out of my hands shortly after. But at that moment, I decided to run it. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> but, nice. You know, scary and probably... Um, Bit silly of me, but I did it, and it worked out for the best on that occasion. I wouldn't do it again. Though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not. I think that's uh, that's good too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm. And uh, you're you're more of a fan of fundamentals, <clears throat> right? Because obviously I'm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do look at fundamentals, but I'm primarily technical based. Yeah. Um, it sounded like you were also a fan of uh, technicals when you were talking about the two hundred and the uptrends. So. Do, do you know what it is? It's um. If something is clearly in a downtrend, mm -hmm. don't touch it. Yeah, and so well, I totally I'll, agree with yeah, that. <laughs> even if you're not into technical analysis and you're not into day trading, if something has been dropping off a cliff for the past three months, the momentum is there. Never yeah. second guess momentum because momentum, I think, is one of the strongest indicators. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what you're doing, just look at the 200 day, even the 100 day moving average. And if it's crossing down below there, you know things are moving away yeah. against your favor. But beyond that, no, I'm not a big fan of technical analysis. And I suppose it comes down to, I heard someone say once um, at a trading conference, he said, you know, when the likes, when the, the people who move the market, whether it's your Bill Ackman's or your Warren Buffett's, mm -hmm. do you think they sort of gather around the board and go, guys, <laughs> it's just moved through the 50-day moving average, we need to <laughs> cut this now. Or, you know, or these guys who are actually moving the market looking at all the, the balance sheet spread, yeah. you know, cash flows, future incomes, geopolitical tension, you know, which do you think they're looking at? And when I heard that, I just thought, you know what? Yeah, I, I think I could get behind that. Mm -hmm. And, and I'd, I'd probably sit with the fundamentals. I like to look at the future revenue growth, top top line, and then the bottom line EPS. And if both yeah. those are sort of trending up above the 100 day or above the 200 day moving average, those are just my first three parameters. And if they tick yeah. go, do you know what? Let's have a delve into this stock. I quite like it on first glance. And that's my sort of yeah. first glance pre-check. Is the top line moving up? Is the bottom line moving up? And is it trending up? Perfect. Right, let's have a delve into this. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, it's, I guess it's not so dissimilar to me. So yeah. obviously on intraday stuff, mm. I'm looking at news and I don't really care about the, the long term yeah. of the stock. Like yeah. to me, it's just like the company is mm. like a, like a, what, what's them thing called that you use to oh. keep it alive? Like a life support machine. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the company is basically the life support yeah. machine for the yeah. stock. Yeah. And the stock is actually yeah. what's more important to me. Yeah. Um, but for sort of medium term swing trades, yes. I want to find the technical mm. base. But then I will dig into the fundamentals yeah. because what I've found is my best trades have always been where. The stock has been completely hammered, but it's yeah. traded sideways for a long period of time. So it's been hammered and now it's moving sideways. Exactly. So it's just so consolidating so, sort of thing. Yeah. 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 So that would be stage one. And then it's starting to like tick up. Yeah, yeah. But also there's a catalyst to drive the price. Like the company might have completely turned itself around. Yes. They've got rid of a loss. But so for example, uh, Crest Chic, they got rid of a, a loss making decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they now focus on higher margin business. They're all in on that strategy. Yeah. So um, there is a catalyst which then triggers the price movement. And exactly. Then once it starts to trigger the price movement, then people can get behind and go, right, by the way, it's got momentum. Bang, straight for the 10 day, straight for the 20 day. And then it starts to sort of pile and steam because everyone on the Twitter, well, well, on the bulletin boards and actually yeah. jumping behind it and sort of sharing charts and stuff like that. That's, that's it. It's like what you said earlier about momentum. Mm. Once the stock is uptrending, yeah. it usually, of course, it's never like a straight line. Yeah, yeah, It, it might fall back like 20% or something, but over the long term, mm. unless something happens, that trend will sort of usually yeah. remain intact. I, I mean, not, not always, that. but, yeah. you know, sometimes if you can even just capture... A few weeks, yeah, or a month or two of a trend, you can make 30, 50, sometimes even 100 percent. Yeah, so you're looking over several weeks and maybe a couple of months and stuff like that. My best trades 
have been six plus months. Yes. Um, so you actually give it time to breathe. So I give it time, time to, to breathe. Yeah. yeah. So for example, harvest minerals yeah. have been long since early January. And aside from when I actually cut it and bought back cheaper, yeah. it's now well, September tomorrow. So yeah. I've been in that nine months. I, th I think that's still got a lot of room. Nice. I, yeah. I mean, I could be wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, but so know, far, so good. The momentum's back in your favour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's it, Pete. And are they aimless, they'll take it. It is aimless, yeah. yeah, and it's it's pretty much hated. Um, <laughs> it, it did a placing to institutions at like yeah. 18 pence and then created all the way to two. But but then it doubled, and that's when it was like becoming interesting because yeah. it was clear at yeah. 2p. Yeah. As I said earlier, the appetite to sell yeah. wasn't there. Yeah, because it, it, it's, it's found its bottom, it's now doubled yeah. in the short term, in the, in the few days we're now trending upwards. Mm. Yeah. Interesting, yeah, because yeah. it, I've always something I wanted to sort of pick your brains on is technical analysis on AIM stocks mm. because I've been on the other side whereby I'm gonna call and tell me it's just you know John from Milton Keynes who needs to fund his divorce quick time mm. and he has to sell like a huge amount of stock. There's nothing to do with the actual stock being bad or anything like no. that. He just needs to find 50 grand, he needs to find it yesterday, yeah, to go right and sell out of my you know, this minerals, that resource, this. And then I can then sit on the chat board and go, oh my God, it's just, look at this engulfing candle, look at this 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 bear flag and stuff like mm. that. And I'm thinking, no, it's just a bloke who's funding his divorce. This, <laughs> there's nothing's changed, it's just the short term price action. Then yeah. it can then create a whole sort of, I don't know. A narrative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It creates a narrative <laughs> that is now, around yeah, this stock is now a pile of crap and no one likes it. And now people are trying me with the technical and asking, yeah. well, it's just <laughs> smashed through these, technical, these, these moving averages. Mm. And it's just interesting to sort of see both sides because with these, um, slightly more liquid stocks, it doesn't take big orders to sort of no. have a big shift in the share price in a moment like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, sometimes a market maker will tick up on the bid yeah. and then the mid price changes mm. and I'll get an alert on my screen saying, this is now broken out or it's triggered a price alert. Yeah. And there's actually been no trades. It's just <laughs> the spread has gone yeah, from yeah. 10 to five. Yeah. And the mid price has, has gone up. Yeah, and that's just the hour. market maker sort of changing it around yeah. a little bit. Yeah, but if you like, if you then extrapolate that on candles, it's like you you can only do so much. I think yeah, in in extremes, technical analysis can be great. Um, like you know, if something has been absolutely hammered for days, you know, at some point there's going to be a relief rally. Yes, you don't yeah, know exactly. when it is. I mean, it's going to be sharp. It's going to be violent, and it's yeah. going to be quick. So you got to, yeah, exactly. You don't know when it will come, but you yeah. know there'll usually be a, like a reversion to the mean. Yes, and then trends over the long run mm. play out. But aside from that, I think technical analysis has its has Just, its limits. And yeah, I don't think Warren Buffett gives a flying yeah. <laughs> no, about yeah. technical analysis. I mean, maybe you can only buy like 50 stocks in the world anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, and I quite yeah. like his sort of methodology of having concentrated portfolios. I'm mm. quite a big believer in that. Um, so a lot, see a lot of people, they, they almost treat it like a, a pick and mix and then just- Yeah, and it is everything. Yeah, because yeah. once you get going, you go, oh, do you fancy like a bit this, of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, God, Phoenix Group looks a bit cheap down here. And then yeah. before you know, you've got sort of, 48 stocks you may as well just mirror the footsie you know? yeah that's it once you go over 20 yeah you start to significantly correlate like, yeah. the index i know and um, to you i don't think there's anything wrong with buying an index tracker because in times like literally what we're in now mm. where we don't really know quite where we're going we're waiting for the next sort of narrative to form we've had the inflation narrative that's maybe starting to top out do we go into a stagflation yeah do we go back into a potential quantitative easing coming back onto the cards uh, but the, these kind of Unknown periods, absolutely no qualms. You're just buying the FTSE tracker for dividend mm. yield, which is the best index for yield. S and P tracker just for stability, yeah, you know, stuff like that. And those those are good scenarios where I don't mind sort of being spread across 500 stocks in the S and P or mm. 100 across the FTSE 100 because I don't quite know where the market's going. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. Cool. I'm waiting for the narrative to merge as to where we're going. But mm. what's what's your kind of feeling on on that in the next sort of three to six months? Do you think? Um, um, the, honest, the interest rate narrative is starting to top out? No idea. Um, <laughs> fair fair but, enough. But yeah. I mean, regarding trackers, when people ask me about stocks, I say, yeah. open a Vanguard stocks and yeah, shares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, exactly, yeah. Buy VUAG, which yeah, yeah, is yeah. Uh, the accumulated one yes, that reinvests exactly. the dividends. Yeah. Um, before, I told everyone to get VUSA. VUSA is a good one, yeah. That's yeah. distributing, and really, you want dividends reinvested. Exactly, yeah. Um, to get that compounding effect. Yeah. You know, might then, not do anything over three years, but if you're holding this and you forget about it, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years later, it makes a difference. I know. A and, difference. and you can set a direct debit yeah. as well. 
And then I say, next time you get a salary increase, yeah. don't buy a new car, yeah. don't get a new yeah. house, because you're paying everyone else. I know. First, I know. pay yeah. yourself first, yeah. like increase those contributions, because, you know, then eventually, yeah. and there's never any guarantee in life, right? But yeah. historically, the US economy and stocks in general in trackers have, have been a good bet. Yeah. So in 20 years, that could be significantly more so yeah personally yeah. i think trackers are great yeah absolutely and actually a couple of ones that i like at the moment for yield i've gone into actually some investment trusts which are quite nice like henson mm. high income uh, city of london and merchants trust noticed a nice spread across the FTSE. um so yeah i uh, like the FTSE for the yield if you, if you need those quarterly payments fantastic mm -hmm. if you want growth then sure maybe the s p 500 might be better so talking about these index trackers like the Vusa mm. and the Vugla and stuff like that, and you've got some nice investment trusts. Actually, I thought nice to sort of actually chat about do you prefer day trading or do you prefer long term investing? Now, for me, this is where we're completely different. Yeah, you're very much a day trader, and I'm very much of the sit back, relax, don't have to worry about it. I don't mm. want to have to look at my day trades and look at price action every sort of half an hour because I've got other yeah. things to be doing. How did like what is it for you that got you into day trading and sort of was that the was that the first portal call was it you started out investing and then got into day trading? Um, so I originally had a tracker mm. with, with uh, Virgin Virgin Money. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Then thought I can do better myself. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, turns out I, I, I did. Oh nice. Um, well, just straight away you just were naturally good at it. Um, I, well, I think I was lucky because yeah. twenty sixteen. Uh, twenty, you know, it was insane bull market. Mm. You could literally buy anything. I know, and make I know. So it, it wasn't hard. Um, but I guess I'm just a curious person. So when I see these big volatile moves, yeah. I think like, what actually drives that? Yeah. How do I make money on that? And it's not. I quite like intraday trading because you know maybe the trade's done in a few hours mm. and you've banged a bit of money. Mm. But then I also like swing trades. Yep. Um, and I'm, I'm very careful to not call them investments, even though I might have them like two <laughs> yeah. plus years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I did have a stock oh, really? in the future. Was, yeah. I think it was 18 months at least. Wow. Um, but to me, it, it's not an investment because it's based on the chart. You know, if yeah, that yeah. falls below the 200 and, and the stops get taken out. Yeah. Done. That's, yeah, it's yeah. like when you were saying before, you've got to be like emotionally ruthless. Yeah. And just cut it. Whereas an investor would think, oh, actually, this is an opportunity to, yeah. to average down. There's probably more scope to get emotionally invested when you're investing because you're yeah. buying into the company and the you know mm. everything that they're doing in future projects, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I, I will look at that, but because I call it a swing trade, yeah. like I've got it in the trade box. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. never like, tempted to, to average down. Um, but I like just having various things. So I might make some money on an intraday trade, but then yeah. I know I've got other things taken away. Um, so were you were sort of, if, if it does go in your favour and the trade, say for instance, swing trade keeps going up, will you just sort of keep upping your, your limit to sell out at, at like trading stop loss so or something like that? I'll usually take profits along the way. And yeah. This is something that I've been quite uh, bad with. I used to have like 15 plus positions Yeah. and I'd just recycle them so they'd go up. I'd recycle, yeah. I'd put them into something else. So I was constantly So you're constantly taking account. profit from one and then putting it into another. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas now I'm, I'm scaling down the number of positions, yeah. but I'm increasing the exposure and I'm trying to run them harder. Because yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. sense to focus on your best ideas. Um, yeah, around, I've got quite fine. a lot of cash now because yeah. I, I don't find anything... Like before, I'd look at something, oh, this looks good, I'll yeah. buy a little bit. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you've got like a long tail of positions that are like 3%. And yeah. You know, if they go up 50%, you've, you've made 1.5%. Yeah, you just stuck with some driftwood on the end of the portfolio. Yeah, yeah. and it's like, is yeah. it actually worth that mental energy I know. Of, of tracking it? I know. And then it's annoying because then you don't take it seriously and then you take your eye off the ball. Yeah. And then you lose money. I mean, this happened to me last year. Yeah. Know, I'm supposed to be good at yeah. this. Um, <laughs> but I mean, the bar to be a successful trader, I don't think is that high. You've just got to be disciplined and, yeah. and learn from Absolutely. mistakes. 
and not mind reading things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or even watching things now. You can watch lots of things, company meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much. It, there's never been a better environment for a trader because there's mm. so much information readily available. Yeah. Mostly you can get for free. There's a couple of bits which you might subscribe to. Like I subscribe to uh, Stockopedia, which I really enjoy, and stuff mm. like that. Um, but actually, picking up on a point you mentioned before about sometimes the mistakes you made was not letting trades run too long or not mm. long enough. Think back to the mistakes I've made because obviously when you lose, you can only lose 100%. Yeah. Thinking back, I used to sort of you know, go on a hunt trying to find the next big thing. You know, mm. Tech stock, billion plus valuation, you know, still emerging of sorts. And then there's been a couple of occasions where I have found the next big thing. Yeah. It's gone up 20%. I thought, bloody, I'm a genius here. Yeah. 20%, take it, you take <laughs> it, and take it profit. Obviously, it goes up another sort of 600%. But yeah. I was too greedy and I was too concentrated on the short term instead of letting it run for the longer term. Yeah, I've done that. Um, yeah. So I'd say my biggest mistake is actually, yeah, running a stock down, being emotionally attached to it, but actually being greedy in the mm. short term and not letting a really good trade run and have the breathing room that it deserves. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think going, you know, my journey probably started out as short-term trading. And as I've got older, I've gone far more, you know, full scope and gone into long-term investing. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably started out with seeing a couple of really good trades, which turned out to be wonderful investments, which I cut short. Yeah. Which would have made, I don't even want to think. Yeah. yeah it's a, no, not crypto money, but yeah, it, it yeah. would have been very lucrative. And I've, you know, mm. Um, and then there's also another, I guess, I've got, I'd say I've, you know, I've got a propensity to, I don't want to have to be worried about looking at the RNSs every morning yeah. to see if there's something going to be absolutely shocking or alarming or if I've won the lottery, <laughs> you know. So companies, I mentioned before, you know, you like sort of Microsoft, your Apple, your Amazons, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like this and Google. I quite like companies where I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. You know, if... <laughs> If I were to apply for a top 50 position at Apple and tell my CV, and I know it goes straight to the shredder, which gives me some comfort, you know, and, you know, constantly evolving. Because if you look at, say, smaller tech companies, the biggest risk they always say, like, well, Apple could just come out and make something similar. Mm. Well, if, if that's the biggest risk, then just buy Apple. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know? Mm -hmm. and these companies, they, they tend to go up to the 20, 25 percent annually on average over a, a five year period. So I know, I mean, to give you an example, my sister's portfolio is just Apple. Okay. Yeah. Don't need to worry about it. You know, the dividend yield goes up a notch, you know, every sort of year or so. And and for me, that's nice. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it. Historically, it does go up 20% a year. Um, and I can just sit back and not have to worry about it. Yeah. You know, and it just takes the pressure off as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think... I mean, um, that makes sense. Yeah. But, but is, is there a point where you would sell it, Tim? Because you must have a point where if things change or... Like, have you thought about that? Like an exit strategy? Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it sounds nice. Not yeah, it does, well. does. And I know what you mean. Yeah, you it know, does sound not, nice. It's not like a small cap. It's yeah. pretty well established. Exactly. Literally one of the best companies on the planet. Precisely. Um, and, and there's going to be situations where, I mean, I've said Apple, but what if I said Meta, you know, mm -hmm. which has completely changed? And there's probably yeah, a good example. Or Netflix, uh, yeah, Netflix, or, or Netflix. Yeah. And it's, it's very much a case of, Right, the reason I bought it initially, has that changed? Mm -hmm. If that has fundamentally changed, I need to cut it. Yeah. For instance, one of the big ones that um, I caught years and years ago, probably 2015, was Netflix, and I sold it way too early, like six months later, and mm -hmm. made a really good turn. Obviously, it went to the moon. On the way down, has the story of Netflix changed? They've topped out on Def growth. Definitely. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'd probably have to be cutting Netflix if I was still in it now. Mm -hmm. um, they're not top dog anymore. They're not emerging anymore. Their rate of growth has dropped. Well, it's not even growing anymore. Yeah. It's declining. You know, do they deserve the high PE that they once had? Probably not. No, so, you that's know, it. Companies can go X growth. And, yeah, uh, you know, people buy it because they think it's now cheap. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, so the, the UK version of that, I guess, is Fever Tree. Oh yes, um, God, what which, a wonderful yeah. stuff! Yeah, <laughs> talk about crypto games. I mean, you, you, yeah. Fever Tree's right there, and and, and Games Workshop as well. Oh, it's another God, cracking yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, 
But I mean, I remember in 2016 looking at yes. Fever Train, I've just read Peter Lynch, and I'm yeah. like, oh, you know, 30, 40 times PE. Oh, yeah. What a load of rubbish. Yes. I'm not buying that. No value to and be had then, there. Yeah. yeah, it just continues going up. And I think it was like a 40 bagger from. Uh, God, what, from even when it was training at 40 PE? Yeah, really? so I think it listed around 140 or something like that, got as high as about 40 quid. Incredible. Something and it goes back to the old ridiculous. thing we were saying before about momentum. Don't ever muck with yeah. momentum, because unless the momentum is stopped, what, Mm. You know, just let it run its course. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, now, you know, then it was like a, a blue ocean market. They created this niche of like a yeah. premium mixer. Yeah. No yeah. one had ever really heard no. about it. Yeah. Um, now Coca-Cola, Schweppes, they've, no. all, they've all got them. It's, yeah. It's, you know, it's tough. And also a fever tree, it's so big. It's like, not, it's more of a commodity now. It's not like the the ultra sort yeah. of premium thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which, which is... Funny because the founder of Grey Goose, a oh, man yeah. called Stan or something, but he basically saw the ultra premium mixers, then doubled the price, differentiated it by creating French vodka, yeah. which is obviously different, but he put it in uh, wine cases. Yeah. So the packaging was, was completely different, designed like a really sleek Very bottle. clever. And Very clever. Then it got bought out, didn't it, by Bacardi for... I think it was Bacardi. Yeah. But basically, he just saw what was there, sidestepped the competition, and created it. Yeah. But, I mean, that's sort of what Fever Tree did, but it's not like that anymore. Incredible stuff. It's a yeah. completely different investment proposition. Yeah. Uh, can it grow in the US? Yes. But yeah. it's not going to have that low hanging fruit of yeah. where it's the only one and it's the end. People thing. know about it now, the secret's out. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, that barrier to entry is lower than it was before. Mm -hmm. You know? That's what I see. Netflix now. So yeah, yeah. I guess because that like now with the streaming wars, it's you know look maybe they they're all bidding obscene mm. money for content. You know for the best content. Yeah. And you know whether it's what you know, Disney or Netflix, they're paying top dollar for this stuff. Um, and I was thinking about the companies who produce content like um, Liberty Group and stuff like that. Whether there's a bit of legs in that one too. Um, but yeah, very interesting market because it's it's hard to sort of find things which are a bit undiscovered at the moment. But mm -hmm. yeah, Netflix had a good run. Um, Disney, they've what, just the other week they've overtaken them on subscribers now, haven't they? Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they've only been going like a year or something, haven't they? Disney Plus. It's uh, not long. About eighteen months. Yeah. And I think Netflix were at about two hundred and twenty million. Mm -hmm. Disney now surpassed it, sort of just peaked across it, okay. two hundred twenty-five, something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very interesting um, stock. But yeah, I think for me, going back to what we were saying before, just buying sort of these big stalwarts, um, they're not going to go bankrupt. Yeah. They're run by the best people in the world. Mm -hmm. Don't need to worry about it, you know, on a weekly basis. But going back to what you're saying, unless if the story does change, then yeah, cut yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. Cut so you, you got to keep your eye on the on the ball, but you don't have to be looking at it every single day. Yeah. You're not going to worry about, yeah. And I, I know what you mean. But that's that just my sense. personal preference because it's mm. like your personal preference is you want to maximize gains and you enjoy this as a full time job. Yeah. And day trading is absolutely fantastic for that. Mm. And there's a part of me which gets tempted to go, oh, I do love day trading. Because it's, <laughs> it's like you're doing so much more analysis, your wealth is in your own hands, um, you know, you're making more decisions. But it's just my specific period in time right now, my mm. lifestyle, I can't be looking at day trades all day long. <laughs> Ironically, running a brokerage keeps yeah. me too busy. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I guess that's completely you know, understandable. Though, yeah. Because you might have a client call up. Yes. And you might be wanting to get rid of it. And uh, but obviously you've got to act for the client. So you yeah. leave that trade on, and then it loses even more money. And exactly, because yeah. I guess there's almost a bit of a conflict. Because like mm. you, you need your broker to be concentrating on your positions. You, you know, rather yeah. than you've got. I'm running, I'm running three shorts and four longs here. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Am I B to neutral? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, I prefer a long-term investing. But if I had the time and I wasn't actually running a brokerage, then I probably would go back into day trading because it is, it is yeah. good fun and you can make some absolutely wonderful trades. Yeah, in, in and a you very make some period. absolute horrible ones yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, something I actually wanted to pick your brains on because you talk about swim trading and momentum. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get into the crypto stuff or no. did you give that a complete swerve? I I, um, I remember trying to get money in and 
and figured it was too hard. Yeah. So then I thought, if it's too hard to get it in, what's it going to be like getting it out? Yeah. Well, and, in uh, terms of literally just trying to deposit with a yeah. crypto brokerage. Yeah, I found that quite hard. I mean, yeah. I'm not the smartest yeah, yeah, guy. Yeah. So. But, but you, yeah, you deposited with probably tens of brokerage accounts. So yeah. anyone's, I couldn't think of someone more qualified than yourself to sort of yeah. instinctively know. It's, it's just a completely new world to me. And also, I'm, it's going to sound funny because people think trading's gambling. Yeah. Like we spoke. I'm not a gambler. No, I don't either. like losing money. No. Like nothing in me yeah. thinks going to a casino is fun because mm. I know the casino has got an edge. Yeah. Like, exactly. So where's the fun? I'm like literally giving my money away. And yeah, I might get a lucky win, but yeah. over the long run, I'm not. Exactly. Whereas in trading, I've got you know, an edge. Okay, yeah. that edge could be taken away from me any day. Yeah. But I'm working hard to keep it. Yeah. But I, I see, you know, over a hundred trades with good risk reward management, yeah. I will make money. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So yeah, that is is sort of why I'm attracted to it. Because I guess it's it's it is different because like you're you're dealing with, I'll call it an asset class. I'm not mm. a big believer in cryptocurrencies. If you can tell yeah. from my tone of voice, <laughs> but you know, you're, you're hopefully you won't upset a few yeah. people. Yeah, <laughs> you will upset everyone. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the the difference for me, it's like. Say, for instance, you know, you remove cryptocurrency from our very existence, nothing changes. Mm. If you remove house builders, pharmaceutical companies, banking infrastructure, which has been around for hundreds of years, everything changes. And let's say, you know, a nuclear bomb lands on us tomorrow from Russia. Mm. Let's won't. hope not. Let's hope not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But would you rather have some bog roll or a cryptocurrency? You know, mm. <laughs> it comes, yeah. And it comes back to that, you know. And so ultimately, I know I'm only investing with nothing more than a herd mentality yeah um and i just have to hope that herd mentality might the fate of where my money goes is in the hands of you know 50 other thousand market participants in whatever emerging coin that i've decided to sort of throw my hat in for mm. um so yeah that's probably I've missed out but maybe not a well, out. yeah i mean i've missed out but i also did quite well in stocks in that yeah. period yeah where i feel like I knew what I was doing, um, but that that sort of herd mentality it also applies to stocks. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Especially in small caps, where most of the dealing yeah. is done by private investors. You know, yeah. when people want money and they're selling stocks, they're not redeploying that cash elsewhere. So yeah. usually, when people are making money, they'll sell it and they'll buy someone else, and yeah. that attracts new people in. Yeah, you'll hear about everyone's making money on stocks. Yeah, which is basically what happened in twenty twenty. Everyone got the free money. Goodness me, yeah, stocks that, were that was a free ride. And exactly. A half. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll see something like that for a long time. Didn't realize it at the time either. You know. Yeah. You know, was, I didn't realize it. That's yeah. that's probably Took me one, a while to get. Yeah. One lesson I learned. I thought we were. I mean, this is so naive, and you do get complacent. Um, I thought it was just going to be a never-ending bull market. I didn't think yeah. for a moment <laughs> interest rates would ever come back and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Because we've had quantitative easing for so many years and it's never caused inflation yeah. or, or hyperinflation. And then obviously we had you know su- huge supply issues. You know, There's mm-hmm. not enough people at the ports, not enough workers, which is actually causing the inflation. Yeah. Um, and I got complacent. You know, I just thought you know these markets are going to go up forever. And it mm-hmm. got to the point where people were literally just picking out companies like GameStop yeah. and stuff like that right <laughs> guys let's get behind this one you know and yeah. it, was, it was wonderful for a time and it was it was pretty fun yeah, yeah. I mean even in January with doing my podcast with John we were yeah. saying this has all got to end soon yes and, yeah. and yeah I was just heavily long yeah. because everything was going up I know I and know. I, I was saying we were all geniuses then yeah <laughs> it's like and what I should have been doing it is stacking on short exposure yeah. and that's one thing I've learned like, yeah now always run a book of longs and shorts yeah. because what well, i just had no shorts do you know something you said the other day i don't know if you said this on twitter or linkedin i think it was you said cash is a position and there's nothing wrong with just having cash because it is like a decision you've made mm. if you haven't gone long or short uh, long or short you've gone neutral and yeah. there's nothing wrong with just you know putting a wedge into just cash alone which mm. i think is i never really thought of it that way but i thought it was a really sort of smart tip actually just to have see cash as a position as well um I think it's such a valid point because there is nothing wrong with it. It's almost admitting I'm not quite sure what's happening mm. here. Um, I don't want to be long. I don't want to be short. I just want to de-risk. Just have cash. It's yeah, fine. and you don't have to have cash forever. You're not missing. It. Just, the markets aren't going anywhere. You know, <laughs> there's always going to be opportunities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The markets are, have been around for well, for a long, long time. 
Um, and, and so what if you want to go cash for like a few weeks or a few months? Nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. And also, you've got the optionality to like yeah. put it into something. Exactly, um, you've, got, you've got firing power. Yeah, you know. yeah. And there's a quote from uh, Jesse Livermore. Mm -hmm. and you, you'll have read that book, right? Reminiscences. Can't say I have, but I'll put it next oh, on the list. Oh, <laughs> Tim, you've got to read it. Oh, it's amazing. It's yeah. like a trader's Bible. Almost. Oh, really? Yeah, no, it's so good. Uh, but there's a quote in there, and he, he's, the chap who is compelled to look at corpse for a year or two always loses more than the cost of the deceased. Right. Wait, wait, what he's saying is basically, you know, you'll lug a corpse around, yeah. but that's not your only loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the real loss is not being able to capitalise on things that are coming your way. Yeah. And, and that's happened to me before I've been. Yeah. And eventually I realised, look, I'm missing out on things because I'm holding... You know, I'm just yeah. seeing something, oh, like, as you say, in the pick and mix, I'll yeah. have that, I'll have that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Suddenly, yeah. you know, you got, like, 20 positions, and yeah. you don't have any conviction. Yeah. But then they might be down, and, like, you don't want to sell them. And I know. Because it hasn't hit your stock, or you just don't want to sell it to buy something else. Yeah. But, yeah, having cash gives you yeah. that flexibility. And it also, if you reduce your positions, so let's say you have 20, now you've got 10. Yeah. But you can increase those 10. Yeah. But have cash it's going to still reduce the volatility on the account yeah obviously if a bigger position goes down more it's going to affect of course the account yeah more but because you've got that buffer of volatility projected mm, exactly it makes more sense yeah so I, I see it as like almost a way of, of thinking where is my capital most effective mm. and there's nothing wrong with with being flat and saying yeah. I'm not short, I'm not long, I'm, I'm going to keep it as an option. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because that's what it is. Cash is an option. It's a free option. Now, Obviously not with inflation. Yeah. But I don't think about that because... I mean, it, it, obviously yeah. inflation is eroding away your money, but at the same time, if it's choppy markets and you're not quite sure what's going to happen... Yeah. Sure, that's fine. Uh, you know, lose it at a percent a quarter, well, mm. more than that, maybe 3% a quarter yeah. or something like that. But... That's God forbid you, you go into stock and then you, you, you've been too eager and then that stock drops 9% and you've also eroded away your buying power for inflation. Yeah. Then you're, you're in double. Yeah, <laughs> you, d you don't really want to buy your stock. Oh, now it's protected from inflation. Yeah. It's 20%. Yeah. Like, oh, well, uh, instead <laughs> yeah. of losing 3%, the court, yeah. I've now lost 20%. I know. So I, know. I don't, and like, it doesn't really matter if you lose a bit. I mean, even in poker, I've never yeah. played it, but I think you have these things where you have to, like, basically lose if you don't bet or something yeah you have the ante so you have to have like a yeah. minimum charge just to sit at the table which sort of comes around every sort of five turns so right you put in your five quid or something like that yeah which I mean, basically is like inflation I well suppose. that's yeah. it i mean obviously when inflation was nothing yeah you literally just had a free yeah ride. yeah exactly but now you've got to pay a bit to sit at the table so uh, what yeah um yeah. you just nothing's changed you wait for the best uh best players yeah and then you play them absolutely and it's not dependent on what he has or what you have or anyone has it's 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 dependent on you and yeah. the management of the emotions so it's absolutely yeah it's almost like a one player game mm. in the fact that your success is dependent on you mm. but then you can build up like a network you know so obviously me and you bounce ideas on yeah. each other and, and other people you talk to and you just share things exactly so it's like a team player game mm. but it's also not because you know if you make money on a stock yeah i might not make money but yeah. we can still help each other out exactly um yeah it's, it's nice to sort of share ideas and mm. stuff like that and yeah I, I, the, the sort of cash of the position I, I think is you know is, is a nice one at the moment the only other areas which i sort of feel comfortable with like i said the old tried and tested which i've loved for years like your apples and your microsoft mm. but apart from that cash and i don't mind some of the sort of big sort of insurance companies or banks which are sort of doing better in high interest rates environments i mean because an insurance company their job is just to sell hordes of cash yeah. you know and benefit from higher <laughs> interest rates mm -hmm. you know hopefully they don't have to sort of you know dip into that the cash sort of, yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah. yeah but you know um the phoenix group lloyds and the, i think those are the only sort of individual holdings i've got at the moment in the uk market they're nice dividend yielders mm -hmm. um, and hopefully they've remained fairly steady in the last three months um but that's that's kind of all I'm doing at the moment, and yeah, cash as well. I'm letting sort of dividends build up, and I'm not sort of reinvesting. Yeah. I'm just letting them sit there for the time being. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, it's like when people say, oh, the company's got loads of cash but hasn't done anything with it. Yeah. Um, like, so? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> thing is, if they give it to you as a special dividend... I know. Right, okay, so they're giving you some money once. Yeah, yeah. But wouldn't you rather that stayed in the company and then maybe they use that money to yes. increase the share price? To their rate of growth, yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, personally, buybacks, if the company's, like, really down... Yeah. I don't see anything wrong with buybacks because you're reducing... Well, it's a buyback your own stock. Yeah. I like that, yeah, because it's a completely mm. different culture to the UK versus America. Because, like, with the UK, they just sort of get all the cash and they pay out those dividends because yeah. you've got this, you know, big pension culture and people mm. need their... And which is nice, but then again, you look at the FTSE 100, it just sort of has moved yeah, sideways. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> I could go back 20 years and we'd be at square mm. one again. Whereas I've always preferred sort of the US markets because they don't pay dividends. Or at a push, they'll buy back their own shares to sort of yeah. tighten up the supply, which just drives the share price higher. Mm-hmm. And actually, they, they have more sort of capital expenditure for future growth, which I which I prefer. But then again, I don't need quarterly payments. I'm not, yeah. I'm not at retirement age. Come back to me in 20 years or 40 years, and then, yes, I'll mm-hmm. be that way alive. But no, uh, I prefer the US market for that sort of stuff anyway. Yeah. I mean, there is the issue of, of buying back stock then giving management nil cost options. Yeah. So it's like the transfer of yeah. shell to cash in yeah. the back pocket of management. But I, I mean, what we mean is like value accretive yeah. buybacks, you know, where the stock is is actually, you know, let's say trading below now. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And maybe management can actually boost EPS more by doing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so that, that's that's quite interesting. Um, it's nice to see the company buying back their own stock. It's like a, a little vote of confidence sometimes, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah. Especially when it's coming from the directors as well and stuff like that. It's, it's a it's nice better when they buy stock yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But exactly. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, so I think Shoe Zone are going to buy back their own stock. Yeah. Um, and that's done quite well. And also the directors hold yeah. like loads of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well. But yeah, is there, is there anything else that you like? In, in investments so you the, you're talking okay. about Apple obviously yeah so like a framework or anything so ones I like so one I'm, I'm really toying with at the moment and it's one of the st- it's a stock which is a company which I really love but I know is just going to really struggle in an interest rate mm. you know hiking environment that's probably match group um, right because they only 25% of singles are using dating apps, which kind of okay. blew my mind. I thought it would be more like 35%, yeah. 40% or something like that. And I just feel like that trend is only going one way. Mm. Um, and Match, um, who owns Tinder, Hinge, ah, okay. Do they? Plenty of Fish. Yeah, yeah. they've got a complete stranglehold. The only one they don't own is Bumble. Yeah. So it's basically Bumble or Match. You know? and right. <laughs> Match trades at a high P because it does have a much bigger sort of stranglehold on the industry. But yeah. Top line revenue growth and bottom line revenue growth all looking very positive. There is obviously the risk of COVID and lockdown and stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, something that I can't remember off the top of my head, but probably historically traded at 30, 40 times forward PE, now down to sort of the, the 20s or something like that. Okay. I think in the right environment with everything else pushing upwards, like top line growth, bottom line growth, um, and actually scope for that market to increase significantly even if it's from 25 percent singles using it to 40 percent i just think there's a huge double whammy there Mm -hmm. um so match group is the only one i'm toying with at the moment but i'm just going to let that one sit until the narrative changes in the main because i think whatever price it is now wouldn't be surprised if i could buy it 20 percent cheaper you know Mm -hmm. six months time the other thing i'm looking at is ibm as a different play because you don't get many dividend payers in america yeah. Well, IBM, I think they're probably yielding about 4.5%, and they are really bolstering their cloud computing division. They had a good set of results recently. Didn't I think it was slightly better than expectations. And if the share price drops to like sub 115, there's no reason why their dividend schedule won't drop off. They've had good results. Mm. Probably puts them on a yield of like over 5%, which for a company which offers some level of growth and actually has the cash to pay dividends. Yeah. Seems like a good one, but again, <laughs> please do do your own research, yeah, and this course. is not advice. Yeah. But yeah, those are the two ones I'm looking at. Probably IBM for the dividend yield because I think it does have some growth, and also Match Group I'm keeping a very close eye on that one as well. Yeah, monopolies um, are pretty good. Yeah. For business. Yeah. 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 But I mean, even if Match doesn't increase the twenty five percent share, that share will get bigger anyway. Yeah. Because there's going to be more population <laughs> yeah. growth. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you you get like an organic growth just through us yeah. growing as a population anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, the, the big risk is is obviously they have 
you know, one of the, the fastest growing markets is Asia. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens that's one of the areas which is most strict with COVID and lockdown and stuff like that. Yeah. So, it, 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 yes, there is a reason why it's cheap, or I say cheap, still high P, but relatively a lot cheaper than where it was, say, 18 months ago during that yeah. mad 2020 <laughs> yeah. run where anything was going up. It know? was fun, though. Yeah, it was yeah. really good fun. Yeah. And it felt a bit like our dot com, because you, know, yes. uh, you know, I remember Pete, Willie Dealer, saying yeah, yeah, yeah. he'd be in the office and you know, a stock would be mentioned on the TV or something, yeah. and it would go up like 100%. Yeah. And uh, he said everyone in the office had stocks. God. Which, like, I mean, we're relatively young, right? Yeah, so yeah, not yeah. many of our friends, act, well, not mine anyway, yeah. actually own stocks or even trackers. Yeah. But back then, he said, like, most, like, everyone really? had stocks. Wow. Yeah. And, so, and we never, because when, when we were talking about the bull market before yeah. COVID, um, I, I thought, well, we're not at that level where everyone owns stocks. So there's yeah. a lot of people left yeah. to buy. Yeah. But then obviously in 2020, everyone did I know. own I know. stocks very yeah. quickly. You know, I had a friend who'd never traded stocks before. And then something got like into it. Eight grand on game stocks. Yeah. And didn't even know what he was doing. I was like, do you even know like the risk of, of what you do? Like what I, a short yeah. squeeze is? And he was like, no, I just don't care. Suits. Don't care. I'm going to hold. Everyone's talking Di- about diamond it. hands. Yeah. Everyone's holding. Yeah. We're yeah. going to screw the suits. I know. I know. I mean, that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Terrible. <laughs> I know. Because it went through different phases and there were these. It's just of, a mania, wasn't it? Yeah. It he had crazy. these random like soft commodities like going ballistic as well. And I'd have friends come out of the woodwork and heard from them. Like, Tim, how do I buy wheat? It's like, well, lots yeah, of different ways yeah. to buy wheat. You have to on, or do you want to buy on a market? Do you want to buy an ETF? Do you want yeah. to buy a future on an option? I mean, Welcome yeah. to the shop, sir. Are you from the 1800s? <laughs> yeah. You're, you're a trade of wheat. Like, got some yeah. cotton as well. Exactly. Cotton, <laughs> soy, wheat, anything. Buy like... something normal. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I know, I know. The only thing I knew of trade of wheat was Jesse Livermore. Like, yeah. Bales of hay and stuff like that. I know, just absolutely bonkers. So yeah. It was a bit of a mania. Actually, that is one thing that, through the good times and the bad, it always gives me some reassurance. We went through a phase where the world literally stopped yeah it literally stopped march 19th mm. and that triggered the most aggressive bull market i've certainly yeah. seen and i always think about that off move i think wasn't it exactly and then yeah. if we do get to a point where interest rates get to you know so high and it does cause recession and mm. we have a big pullback in sort of gdp growth i'm always sort of buoyed by that memory of we did hit rock bottom mm. during covid the world locked out but like closed literally closed yeah but yeah there's still people like bill i can come out going yeah well i'm just buying a bit of starbucks here and a bit of this yeah. and a bit of hill tonight does and then boom we're back off to the race again so there's always that potential there so it doesn't it doesn't unnerve me yeah potentially but well, it does for others sometimes yeah but there's always going to be growth stocks though isn't there there's yeah. always, you know people like the stock market generally like goes up. I mean, most stocks actually underperform treasury bills. That is the harsh reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, we're not randomly picking stocks. Yeah. If you pick good stocks with an edge, there's always going to be money to be made, yeah. long or short. I mean, yeah. Yeah. even in this market, people are saying that's really hard. You can still make money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just Absolutely. go short like things yeah. or just go long good stocks that are breaking out. Yeah. It, it's not impossible. I mean, is it harder? Yeah. Yes. Like, it's not as fun as. What's, what's your criteria to go short of a stock? Because it's, it's the last time I don't ever go short on stocks. I'm pretty much very boring long end. The last time I did it was several months ago. All the airlines yeah. had a massive pop of about 10% on a realisation that maybe COVID won't be around forever. Yeah. I started to go short on IAG. Went nowhere. Fine. Mm-hmm. But it always kind of unnerves me because you've got things like a takeover bid, a short squeeze. Yeah. And, you know, what what is it that sort of helps you come to a sort of comfortable decision that you're happy to go short something because it's not something I really ever do. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty much looking at it in terms of risk to reward. Yeah. So I mean, obviously last year we had a load of COVID floats, yes. which got hammered. <laughs> but there was one called Pro Cook. Yeah. Uh, which did upmarket kitchenware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't say I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, and it just hadn't moved at all, mm-hmm. and it was on. You know, optimistic earnings, but it was clear that if cu- customer belts tighten, which they are, yeah, they're not going to be rushing out to buy fancy kitchenware. Yeah, that is. So you're looking at the whole market and a t- yeah, a, a consumer cycle, I suppose. Yeah, uh, well, in this particular stock, yeah, yeah, and and my rationale and it was, was trading on quite a premium PE. To it, it was quite lofty. Yeah, yeah. you um, think this is a bit high in this market, and if the company beat expectations, it was that market where. 
the stocks just weren't rallying, yes. even if they beat. Even so if I've be, got, yeah. if this is like, it, okay, if it beats and it rallies 10, 20%, I'm yeah. probably going to be able to get out. Um, I remember that chords because it's like anyone would report good or bad. Yeah. No, down you go. Down you go. We yeah. don't care. The forward expectation, we don't believe it. Yeah. Down you go. <laughs> so I was pretty sure there was going to be profit warning. Yeah. Um, so well, at least, at least some like worrying forward guidance at the very least, you know. Yeah. yeah. But also, there was just no bid. Yeah. So every time I sold, you know, I think I sold it from like 140 to 120. Wow. And I was pretty much one of the only people yeah, yeah. doing it. And, and I thought, actually, you know, I shouldn't short more because I'm the one moving the stock price. Yeah. But eventually it sort of triggered a, a fall in the price. And I did warn. Yeah. And I ended up closing it all like just under 40. Yeah. And really? From yeah. 140 all the way down to 40? Yeah. So I mean, it, it warned and it halved. Yeah, it's from like eighty. What a hell of a trade. Um, yeah, but I mean, it wasn't. You know, I didn't do anything fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just risk. And did that reward. just trickle down? It was trickling down, yeah, and then it warned. Um, and you can usually see stocks that are going to warn. That like, yeah. I think Restaurant Group is going to warn. Yeah. Um, I've short. I'm, I'm short that mm -hmm. now. It just seems optimistically priced, and it's you know it's, it's a consumer stock. Yeah. Cool. Like we, we've all seen the surveys that people are spending less, especially on eating out. Yeah, that is right in the firing line. It's, it's getting quite worrying now. I feel yeah. like we're in a situation where this almost needs to be treated like a furlough, like because mm -hmm. it's getting so out of hand. It's, yeah, especially like, with there, the there is bills, like yeah. there is no money for like if, if you're on a minimum wage and you work forty hours a week, there's there's to a point where it's like it, it's almost more economically viable just to be dead because you, you're just yeah. paying bills and nothing else. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy that you can work full time now when yeah. you're not really afford to. And live. literally nothing left over. Yeah. You are just living to pay bills, and that mm. is it. You're just a, an organism. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, even the middle classes are yeah. going to get squeezed. Oh, the poor middle class, uh, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it it's comes true. to that thing yeah. because they get, you know, they get paid and they increase the lifestyle. Yeah. And they, they're not actually getting any richer. They've got yeah. a nice lifestyle. Exactly. But they haven't got any savings. Or... The least old Mercedes is a bit better, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's just, yeah, people are going to get squeezed. And, and so, the money that they should have saved yeah during covid when everyone was gambling on stocks yeah you know is 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 sort of gone and we get with the bill is now due from mm. covid this i mean yeah. ukraine hasn't helped yeah it's made it a lot worse but Amazing. it's not it's not something that and people's mortgages being renewed and stuff like that that's yeah gonna, that's going to really cripple some people yeah ukraine is more like a catalyst to the underlying issue it's not like the cause yeah um and unfortunately i think it's going to get a lot worse for people maybe on that slightly grim note fingers crossed there's a better bull market <laughs> ahead yeah. um but yeah no a really good catching up and um i'll have a look at that cookware my yeah <laughs> it's probably, probably a bit late now <laughs> maybe i'll bid it back up to the top yeah. oh god no, i'll shut it back down <laughs> <laughs> brilliant nice yeah. one well good catching up and uh yeah well uh, yeah, we'll speak again soon yeah pleasure take it easy and uh yeah thanks, thanks for listening thanks for watching yeah <laughs> cheers yeah. see you